thank you for coming out. Uh, this ain't just no show, man. This 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 is some serious serious shit. And I haven't looked at these um, since you put them up on this thing, and man. It just it's just this is um, when I first heard about this, um, my daughters had been planning on going to Ohio with my sister-in-law. So I thought I was gonna have a, a week vacation. <laughs> then I heard about this and I said, man, I need to be there. I said, I'm able to go. It's important for me just to go. Um, and I went there. Um, I called another brother named Yusuf, a lot of you know him, um, to try to help me with the drive. I said, I might have drive to Dayton, but I ain't gonna be able to drive no further. And so Yusuf Shakur, he brought another brother named Az Aziz. Um, and they came, and they really pretty much, I didn't have to drive no more for the five days, I, well, for the four days that they were there, because they had to leave. Um, but it's, it, it was, it's just a life-changing experience. It's nothing that like I've ever experienced. And I've been a lot of places experiencing a lot of shit, man. A lot. I done been to everything. I done been to D.C., Pittsburgh, um, the G20. I thought the G20 was the most amazing shit I had been to in Pittsburgh. This year, um, as soon as we got in, we stopped at this sign. As soon as we went, um, you can you can click a couple pages. We went maybe two blocks, and the powers to be were in motion. They had what you call. Do um, you want me to go down or up? Yeah, this is Yusef, and this is Aziz. They're both brothers out of Detroit, putting in good work. They had so many um, signs that said, "I love Ferguson." <laughs> I said, is this the, you know, I said to myself, is this the right place um, that I'm coming to, man? I couldn't believe it. They had kids, people walking around with Ferguson t-shirts. Um, they had went in and started doing some really ridiculous um, public relations um, work. Mm -hmm. And they even had a big tractor trailer, I mean a big one, one of them extra long ones, full of food bags. Um, and then they had another small truck, like a, it was a pretty big truck, but like one of the U-Haul truck, full of food. And they started, they, they brought all the police there to pass it out, to load it onto the cars that were taking it to the people's houses. Um, you couldn't get these bags unless you were in the house. So this was the way uh, the police getting um, good public relations, you know, just putting some hands-on work in, trying to help the people. Um, it was all a facade, um, a lot of, because the young people there did not care about that. They marched right past them. Um, they were marching a long way, all the way around to the big street. When they started that, the young people just started walking back and forth to them, chanting at the police, um, not going for this, for the announcement. Um, and they did it right where, the, where he got killed at, right on, on Canfield, um, which was very, was ugly anyway. You know, people down there mourning and stuff. Um, this shit is like, this shit is hard for me. Uh, whew. Do you know that in the year 2014, nobody got killed in Ferguson except Michael Brown? You need to know that because you may be assuming that things are going on in Ferguson like they're going on here. Black on black killing each other. It ain't like that. Nobody in Ferguson got murdered until Mike Brown got murdered this year. Um, BD don't tell you that. They left his body out there for five hours, four hours 
Four hours it was uncovered. Four hours it was uncovered. And the only reason they covered it up the fifth hour is because his mother finally came. She didn't get to about four hours, after, you know, four hours. And they wouldn't let her see the body. But everybody, the whole world has seen it just laying out there. But when she came, all they would do was show her uh, as a picture. No ambulance ever came. Nobody ever tried to perform anything. Um, I can't believe he wasn't immediately arrested. Immediately. Um, so when I got there, I, I, I went to Canfield to these housings here. These, this is a uh, housing project. And I started talking with the people. They had, they had a lot of meetings going on, had a lot of people there from across the country, big organizers and all that, but I needed to talk to the people that was in the projects right there, that witnessed it. And none of them um, is going for anything. I need to let you know that to them, you know, I feel for Mike Brown and all that, man, but it is no, it is not about Mike Brown. It ain't, it's bigger than Mike Brown. Enough was really, really enough. Um, and I'm going to tell you something else, which is a really big thing. Some of us are understanding. Do you know they don't even have a crack problem in Ferguson? Wow. I'm, I'm telling you what I know from talking to the hustlers. I talk, that's who I talk to, the real people. Yeah, they got a little heroin problem yeah. and, and weed. They don't even have a crack problem. And that tells you there's not even a lot of crime because a lot of our crime comes from the crack. So Ferguson ain't like what you think, might have thought it was like. Mm -hmm. It's always shoot ups. So why is the big deal now? This police killer. People are moving out of St. Louis to Ferguson to a safe place. But like if we happen to start moving out to Hilton right now, it's gonna be a problem if too many of us move out there, and we're gonna get profiled and all this, and to the point it's gonna be enough is enough. Um, they had a lot of big names come for the funeral. At the funeral, you could, I couldn't believe how many people was there. Um, Snoop Dogg and all that made these appearances. Jesse Jackson, um, and the list goes on. But down here on Canfield, this is Canfield, and this is the housing project. It's all black, but it's not all black. There's like about three um, white families that live there. Um, but, it's all young. I, I, I don't know if I met anybody that lived in that project my age. If they were, they would just stand there to check it on their, their sons and daughters. This is young people, man. This is young people that's, that's, that's doing this whole, whole movement. Right here, they had had a whole bunch of roses from, from here to, to right there where the... Uh, the memorial thing is. It was it was an amazing sight to see. Um, and so people will come by, the older people with their kids. When I say older people, I'm talking about the 30-something year olds with their kids. <laughs> the, the older people would drop a rose there, and the young people would do um, the collage. Over here they have a they had a collage. Pretty good size. Even when I got there, it was pretty good size. It kept getting bigger because all the kids kept drawing and writing things on there. Um, but out of all the stuff that they wrote on there, um, there was one thing that just tore me up when I seen it. It was just the best sign I seen the whole time I was there. And, and I, when we click to that, I'll I show that to you. Yeah, this is... Right there, they also had a more right here. That became really that was that was the collage how it started. It expanded all the way back to the building, um, and quite a ways this way, and quite a ways that way. You could click. I'm gonna show them um, right there, right there, and right there. That's that said it all. That set it off for me. I don't know when I looked at it. 
it just like tore me up and all the little news reporters that came through there, I said, man, y'all need to get a picture of this here. And quite a few of them <clears throat> um, did. But that, that said it all, man. That's how the people were feeling. Um, you had some good talkers. And I don't mean to step on nobody's toes here, man, but the people, the people that live here, they really ain't trying to hear nothing from the, the, the organizations. Mm -hmm. People my age um, in the ministers, they ain't trying to hear nothing from them, man, because it was like three of them, you could count them. There was three of them that was on the ground with them, on the ground. Um, and they respected them because they had, that's, that's there was a church there, I forgot, on Mark Street, St. Mark's Church. They, they did it all, man. They set up uh, first day food, the uh, Maalox for the tear gas and all that. Um, they had it all there for them. Um, and they had the mass and all that. I, I just want to tell you, these people, man, is so determined. The first, you know, it was only looting one night. It was only they broke the windows one night. And believe me, they needed to do everything they needed to do. I applaud them for that. And when they did that, when they broke the windows and stuff, I swear to God, from here to the end of the parking lot, the police was lined up sitting there. Sitting there. And so they are now they got the masks on to, to protect. From, from the tear gas a little bit, so they said they're just gonna sit there. So they one person tried. Oh, yeah, they gonna do nothing. So we went and just raising hell. Some people were just breaking windows, some people grabbed some hair products. Just upset, just enraged. And they did that. And they only did that one night. Um but just in case they was tear gassing them, these dudes adapted. I have so much admiration for them. Do you know the second night that they were throwing that tear gas at them? They had got online from these dudes from Al, Al, Al Jazeera somewhere and watched. And the second night when they were throwing that tear gas at them, they was counting. They had told them how many counts to do, one, two, three, and they was Picking it up, giving it back to him. <laughs> giving it back to him. In one day, they had adopted. You know, uh, we are strong, strong people, man. Uh, we adopt to any situation. Because there's a lot of, I, I hate this to be about a black and white thing, man, but it is a black thing here, man. Um, we adopted some serious shit. A lot of people couldn't adopt to that slavery shit. We was out there singing in the fields. Singing. That's how much we adopted. And so we adopted to this, man. Um, and they is not giving up. You ain't hearing nothing on the news, but I'm in contact with um, several of these people. At least about five of them on, on the regular. But I met a lot of them, but it's five of them. She's one of them. Um, they ain't having it. The day is not happening. There's no easy way out of this for the government. It just isn't. If they indict and convict this man, then you're sending a message across the country to the other cities is that this is what you got to do yeah. to get some justice. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to send that message. Mm -hmm. right. If they don't, it's going to be some shit, man. It's going to be some shit, man. I'm sorry. It's going to be some shit. And they know it. That's why they came with this so extensive. They can, we just need more time. Time is not going to erase this shit. Time is not going to erase. They cold bloody killed him, man. They got the audio where there was like several shots, four or five shots. <coughs> and then he took about a five second break. I, the night they came out with that audio, I happened to be at a meeting with, um, Martin Luther King III, um, the dude that was in the NAACP and a couple other people, but he had the dude from the NAACP had to take, and he was getting ready to take it to the police, but he, he, he played it in there, man. It's like a five second pause. You know, he just, 
And then, I guess he's like target practicer, man. This man, this man should be, he should be already convicted. Let no one be arrested. Uh, here we go. This is the public relations stuff. They're getting ready to uh, unload. There's a truck around here. And they're getting ready to unload. I don't know if you see it. They're getting ready to unload the truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're going to have another U-Haul uh, truck full of, I'm talking about healthy bags. They spent a lot of money. They had that black um, guy, highway patrol guy coming. Public or nothing, that was nothing but another public relations stunt, man. Um, when people asked him serious questions, because I was standing up on the avenue in front, so they marching right when they giving out that food. Yeah, they ain't, they ain't trying to um, do, do nothing. Oh, let me get back to the dudes, all those superstars that was coming. Half of them that never even went on Camfield. They went to the funeral, they never even came. And the funeral was in St. Louis. It wasn't even in Ferguson, so they didn't, they didn't touch base on Ferguson. I, you know, uh, Alziri, uh, what's his name, Jaziri Z? Jaziri X. Yeah, yeah. He was there a lot uh, <laughs> from day one. We ran into him. Um, the dude, Common, some dude named B Banner. What's his name? David oh, Banner. Yeah. yeah, I don't know these dudes, but. <laughs> He's but yeah, and uh, the dude from the Great Debaters. Have you ever seen the Great Debaters? Um, he also played in the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, but he was the dude in the Great Debaters that he was be behind Denzel. To me, he was the lead actor in there. Even though Denzel was in there, he was the lead actor. And he got slapped by the girl. Um, in the end, he just was running it. He was there on the ground with no cameras, no cameras was around. And when he was talking to the people, all of those ones I just mentioned, when they was talking to the people, they wasn't talking no kumbaya shit. They was not talking no kumbaya shit. Uh, they said, this one can't go. This one, we, we can't let this one go. This shit is bigger than Occupy, man. This shit is bigger than Occupy. Uh, these people, these young people, <clears throat> they are amazing. They are amazing in regardless. Now, they got another group of, of young people. They actually have about three or four different groups that always be together. They got what they call the um, First Amendment encampment. Then they changed their name to the Lost Voices. Um, there's a couple girls started that. But then... Mm -hmm. There's about eight or nine other guys that showed up and have been there after that. But the girl, the ones who started it, they ain't get no, you don't see them on the videos or nothing, but they the heart and soul. They the heart and soul of that, you know. Um, there was a brother named Real Old Air. He's the hustler. He's the one who broke it down to me that they don't even have a crack problem. He said, and normally hustlers don't care nothing about this political stuff. They're, they're focused on one thing, money. The hustlers was out there. The hustlers was out there saying enough is enough. You know, um, in fact, the one dude, Rillo, on the day of the funeral, I seen the dude, this dude named Chris Hayes. He's from one of the MSNBC. And he's like interviewing this older dude from St. Louis. And I told him, I said, yo, man, why don't you talk to somebody from Ferguson? <laughs> talk to somebody from Ferguson, one of these young people that's been out here. And he actually did. Uh, he actually was talking. He started interviewing him. Um, this was, I'd never seen military the size of what they had there, except for, except for in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, it was really, um, it was really out of control. Um, even more so than that. Uh, but that was mostly, <clears throat> they didn't throw tear gas like that, not like they did in Ferguson. 
I'll be honest here with you, man. A uh, lot of us have been putting some work in, man, and I respect and love all of y'all for that. But it's always been, I've been like always stood out when I was with y'all because it, was, it wasn't too many people looking like me. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I haven't been all over. It, it just most of the time, it, it ain't a whole lot of us, and I don't know why, because it be our issue. It be our issue, and we don't, we don't be there. This time, this is serious. This is serious. This didn't mobilize the young people. And if, for all you historians, if you know, that's who will bring about the change. Martin Luther King wasn't no old man. When he started doing what he started doing, Malcolm X wasn't no old man when he started doing what he was doing. And the little young boy, the Black Panthers, they really was young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they really was young. 19, 20, 21, one of them was 17. Um, we have to um, just really, man, get behind this, because this is it, because there's no sweet end to this. You're going to get a lot of propaganda. Like, I went to this thing last night, and the one good thing I got out of that is the guy said is, we're called protesters, and the people that support Darren Wilson is uh, supporters. You know, this is how, this is how they changed the uh, dialogue. It had nothing to do with that man. They, they, they had a lie out about a store. The police didn't, didn't know nothing about no story. He got something happened in the store. It was strictly from him telling him to get out the street. And dude, this like saying that he ain't got nothing better to do in his mind. Saying that, and this police thinking that you got the audacity to question my orders. And, and he did what he did. He came from a police department where the whole police department, I've never even heard of that before, but it was actually the whole police department that he was at before that got eliminated. That's how bad, that's where he's coming from. The whole the police department had got, yeah. You know, I never even heard of the whole anything except for maybe back in the early 70s when they got let go of all those um, air traffic controllers. You just don't, you don't, it doesn't happen. So it happened for a real reason. He should have never been allowed to go to another force. He should have never been allowed to go to another force. Um, we need to get together here when they call for it. We can't always, I'm going to be honest, we can't all just go out there. It would be, that would be nice. But when we have, when they call for a rally, for global support, man, we can't sit back. This is Rochester. Mm -hmm. This is a this is a city that have rallies every other week. <laughs> you know, and we have we have a lot of a lot of issues, the racial issues, the police brutality issues. Uh, we got a man in here that did that shit too. We sh it should have been just as much an outrage when Benny Ward got beat down, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it really should have been. It really should have been. You know, um, but we kind of, we like, we're kind of easy going. I'm going to tell you something else. I, I feel sorry that that, that, I, that police shouldn't have got killed. I'm going to tell you how I feel about that. I do agree that he should not have died like that because the brother was out of control. He was in the halfway house. Two days, he would go up missing. He, he really escalated his situation. Nobody has said anything <coughs> bad about this police, but I'm going to tell you something. I really was offended by that shirt his son had on. His son had a shirt on talking about my daddy arrested your daddy that he had written on it. I don't, but I, I didn't get on nowhere and complain about that, <coughs> try to uh, tear his character, he's the victim, he was the victim, so I didn't want to tear, try to tear his character down like they right. did with Michael Brown, right. you know? Um, but I'm gonna tell you, even if, like I said, even if you're pro-police, man, you can't defend this shit. You can't defend this shit, there's no defense to it. Um, 
After me, Yusef, and uh, Aziz, we got together with these young people over there, and we went to a lot of different meetings, and we wanted to be able to do and say we did something concrete. Um, we got a hotel, and we had a couple of them staying. We all just stayed in that hotel room together. We got the brother um, Deruba, Jeffrey Hill. You'll see him in a lot of videos if you go online, um, <coughs> trying to do civil disobedience, not being denied. His name is Jeffrey Hill. He changed it to the Ruba. Um, we did a lot of little stuff for him. Yusef is bringing him over there to Detroit to do uh, a talk. We we did an online GoFundMe thing, and we made T-shirts, Freedom Fighter T-shirts. This is a police officer from. Um, He's a retired police officer. He was out there on the front lines with us. Um, they had they had a dude that came there that was disrespecting them. I had to really uh, say something to him. There was a couple couple groups there that were really antagonizing and trying to create chaos and fights. Um, I'm, like, I'm not going to even pull no punches. I don't care if one of y'all is one of them. I'm going to tell you. It was, they were the Global Revolutionaries or something. It's called Global... Uh, no, the Revolutionary Communists. That's what they were. The Revolutionary... I'm going to tell you. I don't care if you offended. It's the real deal. Um, they was out there... I must have had to break up three or four fights. By myself, I had to break three or four fights. And I can't imagine uh, what else they did. You know, so that means it was infiltration. Same thing they did with Occupy. Same thing they did with Occupy. But they, the people recognized it, and we kind of like made them, made them back up that night because it, it had got to a point, man, people were just getting ready to, to lose it, and the cameras is waiting. That's all they're waiting for is that so they can paint a picture of these young black folks being all wild. Um, this guy here is like, he's one of them untold stories. He's just a guy from, he don't live in this project, but he live in a project called Dade. It's like around the corner, like going from here to Jefferson. The five days that I was there, the lowest temperature was 93 degrees. It averaged 97. 93 was the lowest every day from about 11 till about 8. The man was on the grill, on that hot grill, cooking food for people. I ain't talking about selling food, cooking food and giving it to the people. Um, they had another family. They had another stand set up where they was giving out the cold water and hamburgers and hot dogs. But he was on this grill. So I had offered him, I told him, I said, my car is close. So I turned my car on. And I said, I'm going to put the air conditioning on, man. So when you take your breather, um, you can go up right in there and sit. Don't worry about the gas. But he said, no, I can't take a breather. He, he didn't take off. The man stayed there, man. He's, he, he's He's one of them, his name will never be in the history books, but he's one of them heroes, man, that, that really did his thing. We could click it. Oh, this is a bad picture, but this is a probably, probably about 60 motorcycles, motorcyclists, and black and Hispanic. <coughs> And they came there, and then they just ride through. They got off their motorcycles and hung around there um, and talked to the people. And they all went. They had this big barrel. They went and gave money um, to the community. This wasn't for the organization's barrel. This was for the community up in there. And they had this dude. Got his name. He was he was collecting it. This is uh, some amazing singers that were singing. 
doing what they could to uplift people. Uh, people weren't so sad as they were more determined. You know, the young people, they wasn't just marching, they were <coughs> skipping. And I thought I was the champ. People that know me know that I do champ. And them young people, them young people, is the energy, I'm telling you, it rubbed right off. It was contagious. It was contagious. It rubbed on me, man. It rubbed on me. I can't get to go back. We contemplating, me and this group called Black is contemplating um, getting back there. Right now, we're, we're right. contemplating getting back there um, on the beginning of October, man, because the shit is contagious, man. And, and, and once you... This is it. This is it. There, there's, it's a win-win for us because it's a lose-lose for the government. There's no good way out of this for them. They're either going to empower the rest of the country or empower the rest of the country. <laughs> No, just go ahead through them. If I... I'm a yeah, her. <laughs> yeah, this is the new Black Panther. Um, I'm keeping it funky. And yeah, this is what I do. I keep it real. I don't respect them. And I was with some of the real Black Panthers. Matter of fact, I had two Black Panthers with me. Two real Black Panthers with me. And. When they walked through the crowd, man, I'm telling you, man, it was kind of disrespectful. It was acting like they had Nelson Mandela there. And nobody even would have even knew who this dude was, man, um, if they didn't do that. And they was just bumping people, man, showing no respect. I'm being honest about that. Um, and I was with two real Panthers. No, three. Because, well, the, the didn't come and he didn't go. He, didn't, he wasn't there at the beginning. He came and only stayed one day, but he still was the third panther. He's from California. His name is Arthur. Arthur, but they call him The. I don't know why. I don't know why they call him that part. But none of them, they wasn't feeling that, man. Uh, the Nation of Islam brothers represented. They represented. They, they, uh, they went in that community over there at Canfield and was providing protection for um, Michael's mother and this other lady who had um, the first video. Um, this, this, this brother here, he had got beat down um, before I got there. His shirt means exactly what it said. He survived um, the Ferguson riots because he got <coughs> kind of beat up you know, um, but he was in good spirits. This is at the funeral here. I didn't go inside the funeral. They had a big church over here. You could go over here and watch it on the screen. I didn't even go inside. Uh, that's David Banner. The dude, David Banner. But he he was there. But he was in, he was in Canfield too. Alongside, 97 degree weather, man, they was running alongside the limo. That's this is the rumor. <laughs> this is a little trooper over there right now, <laughs> man. This is what we doing the t-shirt fundraiser for to keep him. He's he's a trooper. He be out on the front line. They was doing fundraisers. Um, he don't let him talk that kumbaya stuff at those uh, meetings or nothing, man. And. He, he really made uh, Martin Luther King III uh, talk to him. He said, no, nah, y'all got the wrong people on that panel. Because they had a panel up there, and they had no young people up there, nobody really from Ferguson, except for the dude who was the head of the NAACP that really wasn't representing them. <laughs> and 
And this is a, another trooper here. His name is Tef, like in Teflon. Mm -hmm. Just call him Tef. He, he's a rapper. Him and um, he had did a fundraiser that we went to. Uh, when we went to the courthouse, he was the spokesperson. Because we went to the courthouse, to the federal courthouse, and they stopped us at the steps. All the police lined up there, so we just did some champs. And then Reverend Saduka, this is Reverend out of um, Boston, and three other, um, Sequoia, how you say his name? Sekou. Sekou. Um, they locked hands and went up them stairs and said, y'all gonna do what y'all got to do, basically. They backed off. But they blocked them when they got near the door. They waited about five more minutes, locked hands, and, and went on in. They had been given the order that to fake a move, but under no circumstances um, do anything. Because one, when they first went up the first step of um, flight of stairs here, there actually was about eight of them, and one of the young brothers, the police, had like put his hands on him, and he flung his arm off of him. In my experience, you're going down. <laughs> you're going down. Right. They backed up, and eight of them got in there. It was like nine of them went up there. Eight of them got in the building. Um, so he's another um, one of the troopers. Just about, and Tory, Tory is, is a good guy, too. These are the people that you want to um, get in touch with because they ain't letting no. You can go there and give them a push. You ain't going there to try to leave them. They, they just ain't having it, man. They know it's all about them, man. It, I, like I say, again, I must say, Michael Brown, God bless the dead. It's a shame he died. Um, but Michael Brown being killed ain't what, what brought this about. It's their reaction. It's these people's reaction to Michael Brown is what brought us here today. And that's what it means. Hands up, don't shoot. Uh, and I'm going to let, that was so cool. I'm going to let somebody else, there's somebody else in this building that also went to um, Ferguson. They went, like two days after I got back, I get a call from somebody to my, Ricardo, where you at? <laughs> <laughs> I'm home, in my bed. <laughs> where I'm at? Like, oh, you ain't here no more? No. It was her butt. She was trying to find me, you know? Uh, but I was just happy to hear that she was there, man. And, uh, and without further ado, here she is. Hi, everybody. I'm Rosemary. Um, I brought, when I got to Ferguson, well, I, well, first I went to St. Louis. And when I got there, I went to this organization. Everybody said, just go to this organization called MORE, Missourians Organizing for Reform and Empowerment. Now, they hooked me up with a place to stay. I stayed there three days. And the rest of the days that I stayed there, I stayed on the street. I actually slept on the street with everybody else. And I loved every minute of it. And when I got there, I went with somebody from Buffalo. He's a very, he's a teacher in the, he's African American, teacher in the public school system. His name is James Payne, and I love him, and the brother was great. But when I got there, all the cameras was gone. All the cameras was gone, and I'm like, okay, so I'm here. First of all, the organizations, as we know as organizations, really didn't know what the heck to do with us. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to find my own way. I'm like, hmm, Ricardo, where I go to? <laughs> he was like, where is that? <laughs> so I went down to uh, Canfield and found the memorial. When I get there, there's people like this. Hands up! Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Hands up! Don't shoot. Hands up! Don't shoot. That's right. So um, I get there, and people are doing this by this memorial. So I get out the car, and this woman just comes up to me and just hugs me. Like, seriously, just hugs me. And, you know, it was very, there's no cameras. There's no big people that Ricardo's talking about. I never saw none of them. 
None of them. And what I saw was a community and a sense of community that I have never felt before since I left New York City and Harlem and the Lower East Side, where I felt that sense of community at. I don't feel it here in Rochester. I'm going to keep it real. I don't feel it here. I felt a sense of community that was absolutely beautiful. And, these, and I said, so what's going to happen when um, Dan, uh, Darren Wilson gets a no bill? He doesn't get indicted. They said, oh, they ain't ready for this. We bring it to them. And I'm talking about, it's going to jump off. They, so when people ask me what's going to happen, I'm going to say, make sure you support bail support because there's going to be needed a lot of bail money, number one. There's a lot of bail money that's going to be needed. They call Missouri the brick city, and they have some beautiful homes. It's all brick, and it's beautiful. They call it the Bible Belt. I don't care how thugged out, rough, and tough the people were, some of the people that I was with, was called the Lost Voices. When I went with, that we talked about a minute ago. When I went to the Lost Voices, my partner said, uh, Rosemary, those are the Crips. <laughs> you do not want to, I'm like, so? <laughs> so, they had a voter registration, they were the only ones with a voter registration table. So, they were the only ones with a voter registration table out. They were the only ones that were sleeping there. They were the only ones that were keeping things alive. The organizations, every time there was a meeting, I had to go to St. Louis to go to the meetings. Wow. You know, and I'm like, something's not right here. <laughs> I'm going to stay in first. So I stayed with the Lost Voices. The, the young ladies that he talked about, the ones that started the Lost Voices, this is her. Her name is Deja. And Deja is 19 years old. She has a brand new baby, and she's been sleeping on the streets with the Lost Voices since it started. And you see her sign, it says the whole damn system is guilty. And she was the real deal. Here is a group of young people, very much like black. That's why when I'm here, I'm going to support black all the way. Because this was a group of young people who decided, you know what? We're going to do this because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Not because they have zero trust in, in, in established organizations. I don't care if you were the unions, how many people. You know, they kept coming to them, y'all need to be trained, and you need this, and you need to do it this way, and you need demands, and you need tactics, and you need strategy, and you need, you need, you need. Yeah. And they're looking at them like, motherfucker, if you don't get out my face. <laughs> them so much they totally loved me <laughs> they did not love my partner at all it was like who is that bougie dude that you are with he has got to go I love you James I hope you never see this film <laughs> but for real they tattooed up and here's what I gotta say movements are made because of crisis and they come out of crisis any change that we do comes out of crisis and the crazy, I'm just going to pass these around. I want to show you one more. These are kinds of like the things that they did. They did a sketch, uh, you know, a thing. I mean, it's, it's Mike Brown's face. These kids are incredibly creative. This is the kid I want you to look at and remember his face. He's got tattoos all over. He is thugged out. He is from the street, and he ain't going to pull no punches. His name is Dante. And Dante is the truth. Dante is the real deal. He is one of the spokespeople of the Lost Voices. Here is a group of kids who decided, Let me, let's get together. They kept on kind of like bumping in. Let me tell you the story of Lost Voices. They kept on bumping into each other at the marches. There's one of them. His name is Loki. Don't ask me why they call him whatever they call him. He, he explained it to me, but I ain't going to tell y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's two things I'm going to show you in these pictures I want you to take a look at. Loki is about six feet tall. He's 15 years old. And my partner kept saying, he need to be home. He need to go to school. He need to be what? You know what? Home may not have been the best situation, number one. And number two, I, th I was so proud of this young man doing something positive and something real in his community. You know, we talked about the Black Panthers, and I'm talking about the old Black Panthers, and how they started. I can imagine that this is how they started. I'm going to tell you uh, one story. So a pastor came over. He was just chilling, you know, and um, talking. I mean, these kids, Dante be talking. I mean, he'll lay it on you. 
Like, these kids are not graduates. They're not the most articulate people, you know. Uh, but think about this. Movements today are not going to look like or feel like or smell like the movements that you are used to or accustomed to. I'm sorry, but we won't bust the sag. Okay? We are going to play hip-hop until your ears bleed. Uh, and yes, the cars are going to smell like reefer. Sorry, they need to legalize this shit anyway. So, the movements of today are going to look really different. And there's a lot of ageism that is happening. And there's a lot of educational elitism that is happening. That means, and I'm not just talking about white to black. I'm talking about black people going, what happened to the Malcolm X's of the world? And the, you know, articulate ta 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 ta. These, you know, I'm not going to follow these youth. You know, it, it's like, really? But they're the ones that are breaking their balls and break it, busting their sweats and really being out there. So, low key is 15. These groups got together and um, recently two of them got arrested. One of them got arrested for manner of walking. How many of you have heard of that? He got arrested right next to me for manner of walking. I said, honey, did you tell him what? Did I have too much swag? You know, did I, you know, hit pop a little bit too much on my walk? No, they arrested him for manner of walking, which when I looked it up, it says that manner of walking means walking on the side of the road. You're supposed to get a ticket for it. You're not even supposed to get arrested. We had to go to the bail support system to get them out, etc. This is something else I wanted to show you. So the media didn't give the real stories of what was happening. So they did mock interviews. You'll see that they have the CNN there. They call this Central Nigga News. <laughs> so they did mock interviews on the street with people about what was really going down. And I thought that that was beautiful. So I'll, pull, I'll just pass these out because, I'm sorry, I bought a digital camera in Ferguson and I have not figured out how to get the pictures onto the computer yet because I'm technologically retarded. So the other thing is there's a lot of you here who are politically savvy. So I do want to talk about that a little bit. Um, I think, Ricardo, you talk, covered the real deal of what was happening. Let me tell you what's happening now. So Bob McCullough is, a, is the investigator for this. He's had, he is the person uh, that is going to be the prosecutor. He is the actual prosecutor. That's OK. Um, so what has happened is that people in Ferguson know that he is completely biased about the situation. His family's been cops, one of his grandfathers, some, somebody in his family was killed on the streets. So he completely has a lot of bias and the community has no faith in him coming back and actually prosecuting um, Darren Wilson. So we held a press conference in St. Louis, of course, in Clayton. Um, and, in, and one of the things that happened was he, they did what I consider now a Cuomo. Governor Nixon did what I consider now a Cuomo. So he was a sneaky son of a son, right? I hope this really doesn't go Cuomo. <laughs> so um, one of the things that he did was he had the executive, he had the authority to actually remove Bob McCullough from being the special, from bringing the prosecutor and actually appoint a special prosecutor, an independent special prosecutor to the case. He rescinded his authority to do that, which left all of the organizations kind of scattered going, well, who the hell is the target and who has the power to remove this man at this point? So everybody's in a tizzy over that. And right now, what the original plan is in terms of the convergence that's happening in Missouri in October was that they were supposed to be coming out. The jury was supposed to decide in, in mid-October if they were going to come back and actually prosecute Darren Wilson or not. That has been moved by a judge to January. So we will not even know if they're going to prosecute Darren Wilson until January. And that came in an email to me today, which I had someone send to the Black, to an organization called Black. So let me back to the Lost Voices. Here was a group of kids who very easily could be on the corner selling some dope or doing some incredibly bad things. When we took them 
to get to the lawyers, you know what they asked me to do? To pull over and stop and take him to the Board of Education because they want Loki to actually get his <coughs> GED. This is a group supporting themselves. So they went and pre-registered that boy to get his GED. Back to, I don't think I finished the story about the lady, the pastor that brought this book. She was like, you know, we don't know our own culture. We don't know our own history. We need to ch teach our children our own history. We are inventors. We are, so, you know, we've got so much to us, right? And we don't teach our kids that. So she brought this book called I Am More Than a Slave that she had written. So the kids, now this is no cameras, no organizations around, decided, you know what, let's get a, let's call a, a youth meeting. And I saw parents bringing little kids, and they sat on a blanket in the, in the middle of the parking lot where they had all their tents and stuff, and they read to them, I am a slave. Does that remind you of the old Black Panthers? Does that remind, like I could see these young kids now, I want to do a little comparison, because we mentioned the Occupy. Occupy was predominantly a white movie. And there's a difference here. There's a big difference here. Occupy established organizations, and people very much in this room, including myself, were like, well, we got to support it, because something needs to happen. Something needs to be done, you know, so on and so forth. And we went, and we supported them, whether in Zuccotti Park or here in Rochester, and we were like, here, some money. Do what you got to do, so on. These young men, on the other hand, people are not trusting them. People have no faith in them. So they're like, oh, baby, what you need, a blanket? What you need, some food? Give us some money. We can figure out what it is that we need. We can figure it out. They have set themselves um, on their own in a very instinctive way. They have set themselves roles. They have a mediator. Boy, these kids are doing restorative practices and don't even know it, right? They have a mediator. They have a PR person. They have two spokespeople. They have a secretary. They have, they have an actual structure. They, they figure out in terms of decision making. It's through consensus. But it also can be done through majority rule, depending on what, you know, how many of them are around. It could be like, hey. You're in charge. We are trusting our <coughs> group of people to do this. So one day, we, um, they, made, they had me go and make 500 flyers for something they called Shut It Down Night. They were going to call it you know, a national night out. They was like, yo, Rocky, you from New York, and we got this book from D.C. Why don't we have a New York and D.C. tent? Now, nobody else is around. All of these organizers that you're talking about are gone. All of the organizations. No one really saw them there. So I was like, okay. So I went and made 500 copies. Boy, I wish I actually supervised organizers. I wish I had organizers like them. Mm. In about three or four hours, they were done. I mean, it's pouring sweat, because 97 feels like 105. Pouring sweat. They had given every last one of those flyers out. Every last one of those flyers out. So that night, every night, they march at 7 p.m down West Florissant, which is the big main road after Canfield, et cetera. So they did, they, we did that that night. That night, we locked down West Florissant. We joined up by hands, and we didn't let any traffic through. Here's the crazy part. As people were passing by, people were very supportive, always honking their horns. I would see mothers and the kids, like six, seven years old, coming back from school with their hands up in the cars. So people know what is going on, but they're keeping it alive within their communities with no media, no nothing. They're keeping it alive. There's this sense of community. There are people who are come by, take those kids' clothes, wash them, fold them. There's this lady that comes by like your unsung hero. She's like the grandmother of the group. She comes by every night. They got some food laid out. They got, they got what they need. You know, it, it's just, and guess what? When they have... They, people bring them stuff, they don't keep it for themselves. They give it to the people in the community. Oh, you thirsty? Go ahead. You, you hungry? Get a plate. They don't keep it stuff for themselves. They are, they are really a beautiful group. Back to the politics, because some of you might be interested in. So Governor Nixon, the thing about you have to understand about Missouri, it's a really a purple state, right? It's, um, it's, 
got a Democratic governor, Governor Nixon, who has done an atrocious job of handling the race situation in, in, in Missouri as a whole. The other thing you have to realize is that uh, Missouri has, what, 91 counties. 91. That's 91 different mayors, 91 different municipalities, etc. Four miles from where Mike Brown got shot, you guys need to look up a video. By, it's about Kajim Powell. This was after, after, I'm going to say, Mike Brown was shot. This was on the 20th. And the police, will sh you will see the police proclaiming that he had every right to do this, that the guy was af coming at him with a knife over his head. And then when you see the video, and you will see the man get killed in the video. So if you can't stomach that, don't watch it. But you will see a man get killed, about 16 to 20 shots being poured into him. And guess what? Daruba just went to meet with his grandmother. And let me just add it <laughs> since you're talking about him. And the, the most offensive shit, after they killed him, they put him in handcuffs. They put they handcuffed him. That's oh, how intimidated they is. After he was dead. Him. That's how intimidated oh, they is of the well, black man, man. That's ridiculous. He would. He had been dead three or four bullets before the last three or four bullets. Oh, and they still, maybe his body was twitching or something. They handcuffed. He was they dead. They handcuffed the dead body, man. He oh, was God. dead as a doornail, oh, and they're yeah. still trying to flop his body around, oh, literally, God. to take this young man and put. And what he said to them was, like, kill me now. And I'm thinking, he's probably saying, after this with my gun, now shoot me. Now shoot me. Well, guess what? 15 seconds after they arrived on the scene, 15 seconds, they shot him down. 20 times oh they shot him. 20 times. It was ridiculous. This is four miles from where Mike Brown was shot. So it's not over. So one of the things I want to ask people in this room, and I think we all need to be asking ourselves is, are we prepared for a Ferguson right here? Because when I was in Ferguson was when the cop got shot. Here, and I was telling them about it, and they was like, oh, man. They weren't like, oh, good for him. Yeah. Oh, good. They weren't saying that. They weren't saying we don't want white people with us. They weren't saying that. They were, like, loving it. They were like, we want the support. We, want, we feel that we're not, getting, we're not getting this reciprocal feeling. They don't want us. We don't mind having white people with us. We don't mind having, we love this kind of support. They don't want us. And it's very clear to them. So what I wanted to say also about back to the being the purple state, I, um, I learned that there's a couple of billionaires, Rex Norquist or something like that is one of the main billionaires in, um, in, in Missouri. And he wants, he's one of those guys, okay, we all know them, charter schools, <laughs> there's a big charter school movement. Right now there was a ballot measure for this November, and nobody's talking about it, to, what was that for? Um, it was about charter schools. There's a ballot measure, and there was nobody really fighting that because everybody is so intent on the Ferguson thing. And, and it might be right. While we were in Ferguson, and Rochester was doing the Show Me 15, and the Fight for 15, and the whole, you know those kids there were like, yo, they just shut down New York City. That's what's up. They are, they, in, in front of my eyes, these kids were becoming politicized. Mm -hmm. And they were metamorphing right in front of my eyes. It was the most beautiful damn thing I have ever seen. And I have never come back so damn angry at what are we doing in our movements. How are we connecting the dots? When we say that we're really working for the disenfranchised, who are we talking about? Just people that can sound like us, or this image of the black person that you have in your head that they should be like? You know, who are we really talking about? Who are we spending the time to make as leaders? You know, are we eschewing the people who have been in prison? Me and Ricardo, most of you know now, that's out the closet. I'm out the closet now. I did eight <laughs> years in prison, you know? If, but I didn't tell you that before then, right? <laughs> you all took me under my wing, you know? I'm from the streets. I felt very, here's the crazy part. Me and my role, I'm the organizing director of, of statewide organization, and I have reinvented myself in order to fit in. 
I have really, really, I sounded like Rosie Perez, honey. So I couldn't get a job for shit. And I got fired from not being able to say Royal right, right here on Lexington Avenue at Royal Environmental. I hope I'm saying that shit right now. So my, what I'm saying is I have reinvented myself in order to satisfy and to be a part of this mainstream and to kind of mainstream, which is really not mainstream because the left is not mainstream, <laughs> uh, and just to kind of fit in and be able to survive. And somebody saw the potential in me and was able to really work with me. And part of that was Metro Justice, I'm not going to lie. It was the Bill McCoys of the world. It was the John Greenbaums of the world who I sat and listened to and who really helped me and who made me aware. And now I don't have blinders on and I've got to keep fighting, right? But the reality, it's really bad. I want to go back to the days when all I thought about was trying to look cute. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, this is hard work. <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is I had to really reinvent myself, but I hope that people in this room, particularly white people, that you can see past and hear the content of what people are saying rather than judging people in terms of the tattoos on the face or the busted sags or not being able to articulate things properly because I had to learn how to articulate and I'm still not very damn good at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the crazy part is that even, it, it's also a hip hop city. One thing that Tef, I, uh, Ricardo pointed Tef out. He's a rapper, it, it goes by Tef Poe. If anybody's into rap, look, listen to him. Just serious, uh, just serious X. He really raps about political stuff. He's really deep. So if you want, if you like rap music, like I like rap music, I'm sorry, my car will be blessed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm taking that away from me. <laughs> um, uh, you can listen to him. Tuff said something really incredibly powerful to me about politics. He said, "You know, man, we got really behind Obama." There were women that were telling me, you know, people who got tasered. Um, I mean, the stories themselves were incredible, but the more that I came back really angry about what the hell are we doing in our movement, you know, what are we really doing? We need black to lead us to, to be down in, on Jefferson Avenue. I'm sorry, you know, you get a bunch of Caucasian folks to go down to Jefferson Avenue and start talking about our issues. I'm not so sure that we're going to get anywhere, really. To be, to be honest, to be completely honest. We need, we need to be led by the young, and we need to put aside the fact that we're thinking that movements are going to look alike, or feel alike, or smell alike, and that we know best, because I'm sorry, you're leading a different kind of people. You are leading, things have changed, this is 2014, it's not the 60s anymore, we're not going to be like, doo da doo da Sorry, we're going to be like, bam, bam, right? <laughs> so, um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is um, the Senate. Um, so the legislature there is controlled by the Republicans, uh, although it's a purple state. And um, the, the, I met two senators. One senator was fantastic. Her name is Maria Chappelle. Even though I don't agree with her on education issues, that reminds me of Lovely, right? Like, I love Lovely. I don't always agree with her on her education stances. Um, so, same thing there, and there's something that I realize. When it comes to education, people are desperate. I don't know how many of you read the book, um, uh, Savage Inequalities. Most of that book was written about Missouri. And when I talk there and I listen to people there, I can tell you that it is incredibly true. If you haven't re read that book, you guys got to read that damn book, Savage Inequalities. I, I mean, it is really good. Jonathan Kozel wrote that book, and it is true. Kids there do not have the things that they need. The, there was a kid whose father was a teacher, and she had gone to another county. Um, last thing, last two more things. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on. So they have put to death 10 people within the last nine months. It's a capital punishment state. The last person that got put to death was this last Wednesday. His name was Ringo. He was also an African-American man who was uh, convicted. Now, the difference is he was guilty. He killed two women um, in Columbia County. It is 
but he was convicted by an all-white jury and an all-white judge in an all-white county where the KKK is actually active. It is, and I'm not talking about active that they march in your damn parade. <clears throat> so Missouri is one of the last states. Secondly, there was a victory while I was down there. Everybody had damn bench warrants. And I'm talking about the political director of SEIU had a damn bench warrant. <laughs> so, and it, the reason is because they are breaking the backs of the poor, and particularly in the African American communities, by these tickets that they're giving. Mm -hmm. So you know we got them red light cameras that and I don't see them in Pittsfield, and I'm like, oh shit, I'm safe out here. I could drive them, <laughs> you know, when I get to Pittsburgh and wherever I gotta go to one of the other places. I could drive anywhere I want to, but in the city, I'm like, oh god, I don't want another fifty dollar ticket. I've been up past that line. Right? Well, they're doing the same thing in these counties, particularly in Ferguson and other communities. They are breaking the backs of people. And when you go to court, if you don't have that $50, guess what? You, go, you either go to jail, something happens. So you have to have a minimum of $50. $50. The tickets can go as high as $1,500 for families who don't have nothing, for families who don't have anything. So there's a real economic thing that's happening. So in Ferguson, they actually won a victory right before I left, and they were able to lift bench warrants. Now, all of this is happening in Ferguson, which is a small blip, according to all of Missouri. There still needs to be, so, there's so much work that needs to be done in Missouri. It was the last state that actually decided to say slavery is over. It's the last state that's done it, and Here's the crazy part. Missouri, when I looked it up, it said that, you know, for the people or something like that, the justice for the people. I said it must be justice for the majority of the people because the majority of the people in, in Missouri are white. Let's not get that confused. The reality is that if you take the whole of Missouri, of Missouri, the majority of the people in Missouri are white. You've got places like Ferguson that have some, despair, you know, some heightening of... And these are people that came out to the suburbs. The Ferguson is the suburbs, thinking that they were going to be safe and that things were going to be better, and it has not gotten that way. It's actually gotten, gotten to the point where they're not giving them the fair and equal treatment that they deserve. So, uh, one more story. Two more, oh my God, I have so many stories. <laughs> so this woman was telling me a story about how she called the police because she had her house robbed. And she has insurance on her apartment, like somebody broke into her house. Rather than the police going in there, taking a report, let's find out how, who did it, what happened, you know, let's protect you all, right? No, they turned on her and basically treated her as if she was the criminal, that she was putting this together while the woman was at work when this happened, and basically, said, basically saying, you know, if you black, you're suspect no matter what. If you are black in Missouri, you are a suspect no matter if you're the victim or the perpetrator. So you, you can't win for losing. The day, um, the day after, you know, those kids had to make a decision on whether or not they were going to stay where they were, were at in this encampment. And they said, well, they're sending the state troopers, the police, the this, the that, in order to evacuate you because of squatters laws. So, you know, the decision was, do you want to deal with the police or do you want to move? And they were like, we don't want to deal with the police. We just want to keep this going. So we picked up tents, walked tents <laughs> down the middle of the street and moved to an old Ponderosa. That night, the police still came and still arrested them for manner of walking. So they can't win for trying. You know, they cannot avoid the police no matter what is happening down there. <coughs> Um, there is, the other thing is, there's a lot of racism down there. Um, at the Ferguson Brew House, the kids were not served. Um, I took the kids once to a store to get something to eat. I was like, come on, we got to go get some lunch. <laughs> you know, I was hungry by that time. And so we went down to get some lunch, and I treated that day. And, oh my God, i got to tell you this. So the kids have to tell you this. The kids, um, there were two organizations, one called Let Us Breathe, like Let Us Live, that decided to use all of the kids' pictures and everything that the kids had done to fundraise without ever telling them 
that they were using the Lost Voices to fundraise. Those kids never saw a dime of that money. Never saw, there was $20,000 raised by one organization and $9,000 raised by another. Those kids are smart. So they called and I was, they let me in because I became the first Puerto Rican member of Lost Voices official. <laughs> hey, <laughs> official. And um, they, they, you know, and when everybody was gone, because I spent time with them, I was not trying to add to their confusion of telling, I, I know strategy, come on, I te train on that these days, and tactics, and this, and what you got to do. I wasn't going there with that attitude. I really wasn't. They needed to do this themselves. And um, so the kid says at the store, he's like, um, you talking about that 60 something, that's a little too much. Uh, can you tell me the price for each thing? So he took out his phone and the calculator. And the man said, no. And he's like, but it's my constitution. This is Dante. I love him. He's like, yo, that's my constitutional right. You got to tell me what I'm paying for. And he's like, well, the white lady's paying for it. And he was like, uh, you need to tell me exactly how much it is. He said, I'll tell you what. You guys need to leave, and I'll serve the white lady. I ain't never been called white lady before in my life. But I swear to God, I was like, uh... We got a little too ghetto with them and let them have it, but we left. Um, so I will not say the things that I said there. <laughs> but don't do that. Do not do that. And uh, Ferguson Brewhouse did the same thing the next day. When they found out that it was the Lost Voices, they brought them lunch. Those kids made them take it back. They made them take it back because the kids tweeted about it. They tweeted about it. They came in, you know, with their, you know, Lost Voices stuff. They do the little bandanas, et cetera. The, one day, one of the kids, about a 12-year-old, stole the phone from one of the Lost Voices. No, a, you know, kids are kids. They, they won't hustle. I was a kid. I would have stole half of y'all wallets already, right, when I was a kid, right? So he stole their phone. Now, I got scared this time, because I seen all of them put on their bandanas, their hoodies, and jump into this car like they was going to do something. And I was like, oh my God, they're going to kill this kid for stealing the phone. And they found the kid. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. They talked to him. They was like, yo, you just like me. I get it where you're coming from. You're trying to hustle the way I hustle, but you take it from the wrong one. Ooh. You take it from me because I'm out here fighting for you. Now the little kid he wants to get all up in arms at that point. He's like, man, I'm going to call my people and they're going to shoot the things up. And he's like, so you want to shoot me now for stealing my phone? You want to shoot me for stealing my phone? Like he was talking a lot of sense to him. So I said, well, what if you hadn't gotten that phone back? He said, I just wouldn't have gotten that phone back. And these are kids that half of the people are expecting to be violent, and they're not being violent. They're supporting education, they're supporting their community, and their community is supporting them. So hands up! Stop
There's very few places, man, when push come to shove, that you can go. I'm just, I'm just telling you, that's the real deal. When push come to shove, there's very few places. And please don't be judgmental of them young people in, in Ferguson because most of us was judged. Yeah. Most of us white folks. Yeah. Man, y'all, they used to talk about y'all hippies so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. That's you know? They, they was judging you by your how you looked. Yeah. And a lot of y'all turned out real good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and the young kids really get it because it's a, the day of the funeral, like I said, it was in St. Louis. The only, the new Black Panthers got on my nerves a little way. They marched through there. But the only other incident of unrest it was, this is when Jesse Jackson was in his um, limo in the line, and they, they stopped, and he had a nerve to have his window down for a couple minutes. They ate him up. <laughs> the crowd, so what, what? He had to close both windows. He couldn't get no air, because people were letting him know, man, we, we, we just ain't going for it. We ain't buying that, what you selling. Um, and before you ask the question, I'm gonna tell you, like, and I got this from you, Chef. As a white person, um, what can I do? Yusef said this, so I'm letting you know that I'm copying what he said, because it's the truth. He said, you got that white privilege? Use it. Use it. Don't say, I don't want to have white privilege. Use it. And engage when you're in them circles. Where I ain't around and they'll say anything. Because I ain't around, or she ain't around, or Craig ain't around. Challenge them on it. Challenge them. That's how you use your white privilege. Challenge them on it. With that, the floor is open. Thank you, Rico. Pat. Rosemary, when you were down there, did you hear about the Hands Up United people? Yes, there's two coalitions. <clears throat> One is Hands Up United, that is the national coalition. They are the ones that are putting together this national convergence that is happening in October. October. It's October 11th through the 13th. I just communicated with the guy on the ground who's the point person. Um, so if you have organizations <coughs> or know of people who want to participate in that, you should get in touch with me. Um, the other coalition is the Don't Shoot Coalition, and that's the local coalition. That's like OBS, the um, Organization for Black Struggle, which Daruba is working with and TEF is working with, et cetera, with, through this guy named Montego. And um, it's, it's called Don't Shoot Coalition. So that's the kind of established local Missourian organizations that have come together. The one beautiful thing that I gotta say about the organizations is that they're all taking a piece of this in one actual thing. You know how our organizations are? We're all working on something different. Like we're not all necessarily working on the same thing. The good thing about this is that everybody is taking a piece of this. Even if they've got their own thing that they're doing, they're still taking a piece of <coughs> this particular issue. It would be beautiful in the progressive movement if we had one thing that we all did something about, despite all the other things, whether it's Gaza or whether it's, you know, um, whether it's the, you know, fight for 15, et cetera. And the fight for 15, they decided not to do it the day that there was the national strike. They decided not to do it in Ferguson. There were people who thought that it should have been done in Ferguson. There were actually people on the McDonald's right there on West Florissant who were willing to walk out. So there were people who thought of it as a lost opportunity, and then there were others who were like, maybe we should just remain with that focus. So out of respect and not to cause the controversy, they decided not to have the strike in Ferguson. So I wanted to share that with you. But people were really supporting, like I showed them what Rochester did. 
people were really, and what um, New York City was doing, and people were really, really supportive of what was happening. So that's, you know, just to know that. Of the two groups that you mentioned a second ago, the Hands Up group and the Missouri Coalition, uh -huh. how would you distinguish between the two? And you know black, our group, that's our group, black. Yep. Um, uh, black. Uh, just black. Just black. <laughs> So because the Don't Shoot Coalition is just local organizations, I would gravitate to the national one, which is Hands Up United, mm -hmm. where if you go on their website, you can sign up for some of their stuff. Um, I have the added advantage from being down there that I also happen to know the guy who's being a point person for all things coming in from like New York and Florida and, and California and wherever else they're coming through. This guy is named Jeff. Oh my God, don't ask me his last name. It's a really hard one. Over murder. Um, <laughs> so anyway, he's, he's actually really good. More, um, the organization Missourians um, more are doing something really unique and as an organizational experiment. So anybody who's really interested in organizational development and organizational stuff, I had a wonderful conversation. It's actually an organizational experiment that um, is, they've taken the self out of it. So you know how we like to promote our organization, whether it's Metro Justice or this or that. They've taken self out of it and what they've done is they're really trying to get as many groups as possible that are progressive within Missouri and help fund them and just train them and let them go. They're not dictating to them anything. They're not telling them what to do. So they were the ones that got the funding for Organization for Black Struggle who, to now have a full-time organizer that they've never had. And they've got Zaruba on a stipend now, so, which is great. So there's some real, there was a really unique thing because of everything I've learned in terms of Saul Alinsky and the organizing models, et cetera. This is really unique and I'd like to watch what happens because it's also very risky in terms of organizational building, if you know what I mean. So there's that part. But um, I just want to say that when real, uh, there's one thing I want to tell you is that real recognizes real. I say that all the time. So when I met with the Lost Voices, we didn't really need to say too much. We, and it was felt so, I've never felt so at home. I love you guys, and I've worked with a lot of you for years, but I never felt so much myself than with this group of people who were thugged out and who are me like years ago, and so on and so forth. And it's kind of an unspoken thing. Like, I, don't, I didn't have to tell them that I was in prison. I didn't have to tell them any of that stuff. It was just, it was, it's just something that happens, right? Like, you know a fellow traveler that has walked in your shoes when you meet them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a little, it, so it was good to be myself for a week. And, but it was also really hard to come back here and say, what are we doing with our movements? What are, who are we organizing? And how are we building the bridges? And how are we discovering the leadership? You, I've seen black so far. And I have never been as excited about youth coming together and leading something. And I'm not trying to tell them what to do. They got these ladies right here. They're, they're, they, they know what they do. something that's real, I would be supporting some an organization like Black because they need their own. And Metro <coughs> Justice has that history. When Fight, Fight needed to have their own. Friends of Fight needed to be friends of Fight. You know, friends of Fight really needed to be friends of Fight. And I think the same thing needs to happen. We don't have another Black organization that is really, you know, and in the Hispanic world, uh, one more thing about Hispanics. I was really pissed off. I was like, where the hell are my people at, you know? I'm Puerto Rican, where the freak are they, right? We're, we're the ones, we, I mean, we get it just as bad. Let, let, let's, not, let's be real about that. 
Puerto Rican can't deny his kids. You don't know what color he's going to come out, right? So, <laughs> seriously, we black, we black, we all kinds of colors, right? So, anyway, I was saying, where are the Spanish people in this fight? And part of it is, if you think about it, I was saying, I wonder if it's, they're focusing the attention on the African Americans, which gives me a breather, right? It might give me a breather, because these people are just as oppressed, and there you have not as many Puerto Ricans as we do in, 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 in New York. What you got is Mexicans. And what you got is a bunch of immigrants who are being arrested at six years old and thrown in cages. And I'm sure all of you know what's going on with ICE. So they get treated just as bad or as worse, and those stories don't come out. When I talk to the African American community there, they were not aware of what was going on with the Mexican community and those communities that get put in, literally, in cages. You can go on Google and you can look it all up and you can see the pictures of six-year-olds in handcuffs <coughs> in cages because they wound up coming here. So there's a lot of similarities and they try to keep black and brown separate. And there's a lot of, we have problems, African Americans, definitely there's problems between African American and white. But there are also interracial dynamics between, I mean, I'm Puerto Rican, and I remember growing up, couldn't stand Dominicans. I'm like, what the fuck is that about? You know, it was ingrained in, oh, you don't like Dominicans, and, and Dominicans don't like Puerto Ricans, and, you know, <clears throat> there's this whole interracial stuff, and people of color have got to understand that we're people of color, and sometimes, White man sits back, I'm not talking about these white people, it's about the white man sits back and watches us destroy ourselves and just comes in and takes over. Right. And it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We are the authority. We should be running shit. You know? So, that's okay. um, So, I mean, I'm gonna have, I'm probably gonna go to you and Ricardo and ask for like contacts and stuff about Ferguson later, but for the sake of like the room and knowing that Hands Up United is calling people down there. If Black goes down there, and we probably have a limited time, probably have like two days, three days max, um, since all of this stuff with the prosecutor is kind of being pushed aside and this rally is still happening, do you think Black should make an effort to link up with that organization and be at the rally? Yes. Or is that possibly losing a day of being with Lost Voices or OBS? Actually, what they're saying is we can meet up either in Ferguson. So they're actually coordinating it because being a day with Lost Voices or OBS, etc., isn't what well, this is. A, there's going to be like 10,000 people. You're going to have 10,000 people. Hopefully, that is the aim to get at least that many people down there and really converge. So it's going to be kind of a movement of coming in, supporting, and being with as many people who are like-minded from across the country as possible, and allowing ourselves to be led by the people who are on the ground. So I, 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 all I can tell you is I sent you guys the email. I don't think I sent you guys the follow-up of what, they've, what they're saying, but I didn't know who to get it to. Somebody sent it to so on and so forth. So. Mm -hmm. I can keep you in the loop, and I, like I said, I would be happy to put you in touch with Jeff or someone on the ground so you can talk directly to him. And I, I, um, I have no doubt she knows what she's talking about, but I just know that from my experience here, um, the don't shoot an OBS groups were, always had their meetings right there, like right around the corner from where he got shot at St. Mark's Church. And some of the other meetings always occurred like in St. Louis, you know, uh, for me that took a little bit of um, the credibility. Uh, OBS was right there. Working with Daruba, and Teff, and Tori, and David, um, trying to get them something that they can grab on, a stipend, 
you know, they doing they doing the work anyway, but they need to live. Um, the Ruben needed some place for his dog. He got a couple, he got a pit bull with some puppies. And he's standing in the storefront, man, um, with somebody, sharing that with somebody. You know, he needed to upgrade his situation. People were offering him space, but they ain't nobody want to, no, you can't bring them dogs. And so, by him getting a stipend, that's, that's able for him to not just fight for the people to enhance his situation, man. And I can see where, I can see something concrete there. I can see where my money is going. That's why me and you stepped in, we got the t-shirt thing going, um, and we was like working with them, we can see where it's going. I just, I'm like them. I don't have that much faith in them. When it, the bigger it gets, them organizations, I just don't know how much money is going to trickle down right there in the community right. um, where right. it needs the people who sparked this. Because like I said, once again, man, it wasn't Michael Brown. It was them people's reaction mm -hmm. to Michael Brown that sparked it. And I want to, some of you came in late and didn't see um, the thing that stood out the most for me on the um, collage. It was just a little word, some little kid wrote, help. Mm -hmm. um, I need us to not lose focus because the youth here in Rochester are sick. They haven't written that sign, but goddamn, man. They need some help here, man. Mm -hmm. They need some help here, man. The youth here, man. Um, don't be judgmental of them, man. They in survival mode. Same thing, I'm telling you, I went to prison. I was a good dude before I went to prison. Some of you, a couple of y'all probably didn't know that. <laughs> I've been to prison. But when I got in there, man, I had to go to survival mode. <laughs> and I had to be that MF. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, Started a fight in the cafeteria the first day. I waited till the guard got near so that he's going to be able to break it up and I ain't going to be able to... You Seriously, seriously, because I'm scared to death. I'm scared to death. And so I hit the dude. The dude he called me country. That's all he had said. You know, every, if you ain't from New York City, you consider it country. And so in the mess hall, I took the metal tray, I waited till the guard was close enough to he, I'm gonna look good, cause I hit the dude, bam! And the bully said, break it up. And I was, okay. <laughs> but, I had adjusted. I had adjusted to do what I needed to do. And that's what these kids out here is doing, man. It's, it's hell out here. And just trying to say, oh, you just gotta keep going the straight path. That's not getting it. Kids is dying out here, man. So they're adjusting to survive. And then we're making judgments on them, man. They're saying, what they really are saying is just like that little sign that we have, man. They're saying help, man. We need to try to help our youth here, man. Thank you to the squirrel. Out there 
if something goes, and you know, the day before something mm -hmm. went down, and, and mm -hmm. Mike and them is in there, so I had to just take my nephew and go stand out there with him, man. Yeah. I, I couldn't give him nothing, but I could stand there and try to, we just, we need to push for, keep the conversation going in certain circles about the groups, man. Teen empowerment is, and I'm not saying this because Jennifer Bannister's in there. I'm getting up to anybody scared of her. Ain't nobody scared, scared of nothing about her. And then you got to do Derek Coley around here. Uh, that puts the exhort up. These are the people, man. You ain't got to look far, man. Um, and everybody else, some people got to continue to do what they, because there's a lot of different fronts. People got to fight the education front. People got to fight, um, I got to go over again, I'm going to step on yeah. some toes. They got to fight against this bullshit going on in Israel. <laughs> and all this shit, man. The fracking, all of that. So you, I don't, ain't telling you to step on your fronts because everybody's got a role. But, with the spare time, man, and I don't have the answer. I don't have exactly what the answer is, uh, but we gotta help our youth. All right. I would say one concrete thing we can do, a lot of the, the leadership of black, they're college students, they're young, they may not have a lot of money, we can, we can send them first. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. We, can, we can raise money to get them yeah. to Ferguson and get them back so that they can take up their role here. So if, if you're interested in that, see me, find me somehow, because I'm going to do that on Facebook. I'm going to circulate the word. Anybody wants to give 25, 50, 100 bucks, we, we can send them there at no cost to them. In the next couple of days or something? What's that? Yeah, Pretty soon. Yeah. Well, they're going to have to go to the 13th. Oh, yeah. 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 I was going to say, I have a sheet of paper. If anybody wants to be on our email list, I'm just going to keep this here. People can keep filling out pages with your name and your email address. And um, the trip might not be that expensive, and we would we would be grateful for any funds we can get to cover the trip. But I mean, realistically, like people are getting arrested down there, and I was thinking during this meeting we might need a bail fund. Right. So that might be where okay. money really needs to come from. Like we can share cars and food and stuff like that, but that might be something. incarceration month here at the Flying Squirrel. So we're doing a lot of programming coming. We've got, we've got panels. I think we're going to try to get Ricardo and, and Rosemary back on a panel talking about Ferguson. We've got uh, People's History of the FBI film series and discussion series. We've got panels, fun. The first of November is going to be a, um, a court of injustice upstairs, a, a, a prison of horrors in the basement, candy costumes, projections, We've got a lot coming up, so you'll see Facebook announcements and come here and get more information, but lots, lots more.